All right, so let us um, begin our discussion. Um, Elizabethan literature by looking at the anatomy of wits by John Lilly. The anatomy of wit, Euphus, the anatomy of wit by John Lilly. The work was published in 1579. Euphus, the anatomy of wit is on the causal line. Was published in fifteen seventy nine. It is prose. It is prose. You can call it Renaissance prose. Remember, it's not all the time that you study prose in the Renaissance period. So you are lucky to study the Renaissance prose. Often you study, in the Renaissance, you study epic, drama, pastoral poetry, and so on. So I feel that you should study whatever prose there is. So the, the style that characterizes the anatomy of wit by John Lilly is called Euphuism. To understand Lilly's The Anatomy of Wit, one needs to, first of all, grapple with the concept of Euphuism. Because that is central to the understanding of it. Yes. So what is Euphuism? What is Euphuism? According to Richard Nordquist, according to Richard Nordquist, in a 2017 article, according to Richard Nordquist, in a 2017 article. Euphuism is defined as put, as put, an elaborate, an elaborately patterned prose, as an elaborately patterned prose style, as an elaborately patterned prose style, characterized in particular by the extensive use of similes, metaphors, parallelism, alliteration, and antithesis. An elaborately patterned prose style characterized in particular by the extensive use of similes, metaphors, Parallelism, alliteration, and antithesis. So where where simile denotes Where simile denotes where simile denotes a kind of comparison, kind of comparison, 
which makes use of as or like. A metaphor denotes a kind of comparison without the use of as or like. Where similarly denotes a kind of comparison which makes use of as or like, whereas metaphor denotes a kind of comparison without the use of as or like. And parallelism denotes the use of parallel structures. Parallelism denotes the use of what? Parallel structures. Parallelism denotes the use of parallel structures. In a work of art. Parallel structures are grammatical categories with similar structures. Parallel structures are grammatical categories of the same level, the same pattern. Parallelism marks similarity of structure in a pair or series of related words, phrases, or clauses. Similarity of structure in a pair or series of related words, phrases, or clauses. Parallelism marks similarity of structure in a pair or series of related words, phrases, or clauses. These are some of the principles of parallelism. These are some of the principles of parallelism. One, there, there are usually phrases of equal length which appear in succession. There are usually phrases of equal length which appear in succession. Two, the balance of key verbal elements in successive sentences. The balance of key verbal elements in successive sentences. The balance of key verbal elements in successive sentences. Three, the correspondence of sounds and syllables. The correspondence of sounds and syllables. especially between words that are already balanced against each other. It's really against words that are really already balanced against each other. Euphuism is denoted by witty expression. Euphuism is a, a prose style denoted by 
the use of witty expression, W-I-W-T-Y, witty expression. So as we study the text, you fuse the anatomy of which we will take some excerpts to illustrate the presence of this post style. The style is on it in nature, it's elaborate in nature. It's I say it's decorative. It's as if one is writing prose using a poetic style. Because the writer is conscious of infusing tropes like simile, metaphor, parallelism into and, and bring about balance into the sentence. So let us move on and look at the key characters in the prose text. You fuse the anatomy of it. Let's move on and look at the key characters in the prose te text. You fuse the anatomy of it. The chief characters. You have Euphius, a young gentleman of Athens. Euphius, a young gentleman of Athens. And then you have Philotus, a young gentleman of Naples. And then you have Eubulus, an old Gentleman of Naples. Then you have Lucilla, daughter daughter of Don Ferrado. Don Ferrado. They have Don Ferrado. One of the chief governors of Naples. One of the chief governors of Naples. Then you have Libya. A lady of Naples. In the house of Den Don Ferrado. Then you have setting. The setting of the work is Naples and Athens. The temporal setting is not specified, but we think it is the Renaissance. 
And though the world mentions Athens and Naples, you know that it refers to England. And the English people, because the Renaissance work, he likes drawing from, likes drawing from, classical tradition. As the novel begins, the novel begins, Euphus is described as the as a gentleman of great patrimony and beauty and handsomeness. He has beauty, has money. Blessed with nature and fortune. He is described as having more wit than wealth and more wealth than wisdom. He is described as having more wit, more wit than wealth and more wealth than wisdom. So the, the word euphus means well endowed with natural gifts, both physical and intellectual. So the character euphus is a scholar. The character euphus is, is a scholar given to reading. It's given to reading. Euphus means well endowed with natural gifts, both physical and intellectual. So anatomy of wit implies the analysis of or exposition of wit. Anatomy of wit implies the analysis, elaboration on wit and exposition on wit, W-I-T. Wit means talent for studies. Wit also means intellectual capacity. Wit means talent for studies. Wit also means intellectual capacity. Wit also means worldly curiosity and an unholy desire for knowledge. Wit also means worldly curiosity and an unholy desire for knowledge. That is the lust of the mind, L-U-S-T, the lust of the mind. Which also stands for the dangerous tendencies of the Renaissance in their, in their conflict with um, religious ideas of the Reformation. Wit also stands for the dangerous tendencies of the Renaissance in their conflict with religious ideas. This work is dedicated to Sir William West. Most writers then used to dedicate their works to patrons, so you can find it here. The work is dedicated to Sir William West. West, W-E-S-T. Listen to the statement of the dedication. To the Right Honorable, my very good Lord and Master, Sir William West, Knight, Lord Delaware, 
John Lilly wishes long life to increase at home. That's the testament of the dedication. In the text, we are told that Euphrates begins with love as allured by wit, but ends with lust as bereft of wisdom. So one statement hints at Euphrates character or Euphrates characterization. And the statement states, statement states, the vanities of his love as the virtues of his life. The vanities of his love as the virtues of his life. That statement is it's a good example of parallel structure because of the balance on the two sides. The vanities of his love balances with the virtues of his life. Then we also find um, the use of the nature tradition where human realities are compared to nature in the world. The world is rich in nature tradition. Euphues, the anatomy of wit is rich in the nature tradition. The nature tradition. A good example is in the expression, gentlemen use books as gentlewomen handle their flowers, who in the morning stick them in their heads and at night strew them at their heels. Gentlemen use books as gentlewomen handle their flowers, who in the morning stick them in their heads and at night strew them at their heels. The story told in Euphrates the Anatomy of Wit is set in Athens. It's set in Athens. Athens is where you feel slaves. At a point, at the point, his parents died, and the wealth goes to Euphrates. Now, how you feel will spend this money is the concern of this book. So with the money, you feel desire to travel to Naples. You feel desire to travel to Naples. In the book, Naples is described as 
a place of more pleasure than profit, and yet of more profit than piety. In the novel, Naples is described as a place of more pleasure than profit, and yet of more profit than piety. A place of more pleasure than profit, and yet of more profit than piety, P-I-E-T-Y. Meaning that Naples, Naples is a dangerous place for young minds, for young persons to live in. Because it values pleasure over anything else. and values profit over doing the right things. Meaning that the city is materialistic and mundane. The city of Naples is materialistic and mundane. So Naples is depicted as a corrupt place. Naples is depicted as a corrupt place. There was all things necessary and in readiness that might either allure the mind to lust or entice the heart to folly. That was Naples, corrupt place. There was all things necessary and in readiness that might either allure the mind to lust or entice the heart to folly. But this is where you feel decides to stay. You could have easily passed another place where it says you die here. You feel decides to stay in Naples. Naples is also depicted as a place that lacks humanity. Naples is also depicted as a place that lacks humanity. It is full of cruelty and selfishness. It's full of cruelty and selfishness. So everywhere is a bet. Everywhere is a bet. To trap. Everywhere is a bet to trap the individual. In Naples, Euphius has all kinds of friends. In Naples, Lucius has all kinds of friends who are actually after his money. Who are actually after his money. These friends are actually after his money. They are predatory in nature. These friends are predatory in nature. So the author uses the word like salt and poison to describe them. The author, the author uses words like salt and poison to do what? Describe. To describe them. Euphus is living well in Naples. Euphus is living well in Naples. He has money and lives in a mansion. He has money and lives in a mansion house. If he is living well in Naples, he has money 
and lives in a mansion house. But we are told that Yuvis is wise enough to avoid being destroyed by these friends. Yuvis is wise enough to avoid being destroyed by these friends. In the words of the narrator, in the words of the narrator, Of course, the novel is written from the third person narrative point of view. In the words of the narrator, he welcomed all but trusted none. He welcomed all but trusted none. He was merry, but yet so weary that neither the flattery could take advantage to entrap him. So he was careful with a friend. Being a Renaissance work, we have instances of historic of classical allusion in the work. Being a Renaissance work, we have instances of what? classical allusion in this work. Classical allusion is a type of allusion that makes reference to the classical period. A good example of classical allusion in the work is seen in the statement, quote. A good example of classical allusion is seen in the statement, quote. The Trojans repented too late when that town was spoiled. The Trojans repented too late when that town was spoiled. Referring to the burning down of Troy. An old man by name Eubulus. An old man, an, an old man by name Eubulus notices how Euphus is living in Naples and decides to advise him. And decides to advise him. But Euphus refuses to keep the advice of the old man. Euphus refuses to abide by the advice of the old man. He ignores the warning of Eubulus. and even insults Eubulus by saying that probably because he's old, he doesn't want a young man to enjoy himself. He's old and cannot enjoy himself anymore, so he wants young people to not enjoy themselves like him. Either you would have all men old as you are, or else you have quit forgotten, you have quite forgotten that you yourself were young, or even knew young days. That means being young or youthful is a trap for the young person, because the temporality 
is designed to make the person live the way you, uh, you feel as, as lived. Young people are given to enjoyment. So Eubulus warns you feels that the city corrupts. The city of Naples corrupts. And that it is likely that you feel will be corrupted by the city. The word you believe means good or prudent in counsel. The name you believe means good or prudent in counsel. So you believe is telling you feel that by me living in this city, you cannot escape corruption. But Euphus uses the nature tradition to counter Eubulus' statement by saying, the sun shines upon the downhill and is not corrupted. The diamond lies in the fire and is not consumed. The crystal touches the toad and is not poisoned. Meaning that there is something in nature to show that living in a corrupt place might not necessarily mean that you're going to be corrupt. Okay? That's what we mean by nature tradition, taking lessons from nature, drawing conclusions, parallels between human world and the nature, our natural life. The sun shines on the downhill and is not corrupted. That the sun gets in touch with the downhill and is not corrupted by the, by the downhill. The diamond lies in the fire and is not consumed. So it's like saying, if this can happen in nature, then I can live in Naples and not be corrupted. So that's nature tradition. Right? So some of the words of Euphuse qualify as insult to the old man, Eubulus. By uh, in trying to accept that he could live and thrive, by trying to accept that he could live and thrive in a corrupted city, Euphus says this to Eubulus and adds some insult to spice it up. Is it not common that the hind tree springed amidst the beach, the ivy spread it upon hard stones? that the soft feather bed that the soft feather bed breaks the hard blade. If experience have not taught you this, you have not you have not If experience have not taught you this, you have lived long and learned little. Or if your moist brain have forgot it, you have learned much and profited nothing. <laughs> As an insult to the old man. And he has lived for a long time, but has learned little for the long time he has lived. And uh, if his moist brain have forgotten the lesson, then he has learned much and profited nothing from all his learning. Uh, Euphus also accuses Eubulus of projection. 
that he's judging um, Euphus based on his own weakness or inadequacies. So at a point, Euphus decides to leave uh, Euphus alone. Euphus decides to leave Euphus alone and to go and meet his friends. Because after having talked to him over and over, he has not listened. So he says, he tells him, saying thou will not buy counsel at the first, at the hand, good cheap. Thy shall buy repentance at the second hand, as such an unreasonable wretch that thou will curse thy hard pennyworth and burn thy hard heart. So what Eubulus is saying that Euphus will regret not listening to his advice in those words. And mark that statement as a kind of um, foreshadowing of what will happen at the end of the story. So the repentance talked about this means regret. That is giving him counsel now at a cheap rate using marketing terms. First hand, somebody that is old and experienced and is giving him advice based on his age and experience that he should listen to and avoid all the troubles and he has not listened. Then, when he will regret, the regret will come with a high cost. That's what it means. That's what it means. So, Ibelus goes to his house in sadness over Yuki's behavior. So some time has passed, and Uvius is by now um, two months old in Naples. He has lived in Naples for two months. And he has a very good friend in Naples by name Pilatus. He has a very good friend in Naples by name Pilatus. to note this quote on friendship, but it's quite poetic. A friend is in prosperity a pleasure, comma, a solace in adversity, in grief a comfort, in joy a merry companion. I'll do that again. A friend is in prosperity, a pleasure, comma, a solace in adversity, comma, in grief, a comfort, comma, in joy, a merry company. So that's an important quote on friendship. A friend is in prosperity, a pleasure, a solace in adversity, in grief, a comfort, in joy, a merry company. That means a friend is someone who stays in all situations. Okay? No one who stays only when the going is good and runs away once the weather changes. So even in that quote, you could see the manifestation of the element of parallelism or elements of euphemism, including parallel structures. 
A friend is in prosperity, a pleasure, a solace in adversity, in grief, a comfort, in joy, a merry companion. Mostly made up of um, metaphors. And then another quote on friendship from the novel goes thus, is there anything in the world to be repeated? I will not compare, I will not say compare to friendship. Can any treasure in this transitory pilgrimage be of more value than a friend in whose bosom thou mayst live secure without fear? Whom thou mayst make partner of all thy secrets without suspicion of fraud, and partaker of all thy misfortunes without mistrust or fleeting, who will account thy bell is burned, thy mishap is misery, the pricking of thy finger, the piercing of his heart. Those are the characteristics of good friendship, and I will check it again. The expression begins, the, the quote begins with a rhetorical question. This is one of the tropes in euphemism. Is there anything in the, in the world to be repeated to friendship? Can any treasure in this transitory pilgrimage be of more value than a friend in whose bosom thou mayst sleep secure without fear, whom thou mayst make partner of all thy secrets without suspicion of fraud, and partaker of all thy misfortune without mistrust of fleeting, who will account thy bell is pain, thy mishap is misery, the pricking of thy finger, the piercing of his heart. So this is Euphus' uh, solilo soliloquy on friendship. When he thinks on his friendship with uh, Philatus. In this world, friendship is seen to be the jewel of human joy. So the theme of friendship is a major theme in this novel. Theme of friendship. Friendship is a major theme in this novel. Then there is also foreshadowing. It's a device of foreshadowing to tell us what is going to happen in the future in the, in the novel. And that is seen in the following words, following quote. As in the sequel of Euphus and Pilatus, whose hot love waxed soon cold. Whose hot love waxed soon cold. Especially this happens in human love. Because God's love is eternal. But human love is full of weaknesses. And so, even when it is hot, it is likely to wax cold soon. And that's what will happen between the friendship of Pilatus and Euphus. As in the sequel of Euphus and Pilatus, whose heart love wax soon cold. I would like to write, I would like you to write this one down. Again, the presence of nature tradition in, um, in the work. But this device is what we call analogy. Called what? Analogy. Of course, it is through analogy that the nature tradition is deployed because in analogy you use what happens in nature to account for human realities. You use the realities in nature to account for what happens in human relations to human realities. And so let's look at this statement. Let's let's examine this statement. Okay? Listen to this statement. Then we explain it. For as the best wine doth make it the sharpest vinegar, so the deepest love turneth to the deadliest hate. 
I'll check that again. For as the best wine doth make it the sharpest vinegar, so the deepest love turneth to the deadliest hate. Unquote. One person once said that hatred is love turned inside out. Hatred is love turned inside out. That the reverse side of love is hatred, so on and so forth. So that's what is captured in that expression. For as the best wine does make it the sharpest vinegar, so the deepest love turned it to the deadliest hate. So the, 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 the nature tradition is comparing how the best wine is used, um, is, is used to produce vinegar. Vinegar is known for its bitter taste. Wine is known for being sweet in taste. Right? Right? Good. And then that nature tradition, and now it's used to compare with human reality, which is love turning to deadliest hate. So that's the nature tradition. So Euphus makes a speech that indicates the depth of his friendship with Pilatus. He calls him gentleman and friend, comparing their friendship to the Uh, to those of an, uh, the ancient, like Damon and Pythias, Pilate and Orestes, and even says that their friendship surpasses those of the ancient, which is hyperbolic. The use of hyperbolic in the text, exaggeration. So while making this speech, he does not know that. Philosophy is around and has it dropped. And so Philatus responds to Euphus' um, um, speech, calling him friend Euphus. And then he, uh, he acknowledges that they have shared similar qualities. And seeing we resemble, as you say, each other in qualities. It cannot be that one should differ from the other in courtesy. So the two go on to talk about their friendship in glowing terms. And then Pilatus says to um, Euphus in another foreshadowing statement, trial shall prove trust. You get it. Trial shall prove trust. Because that is the true t test of friendship or loyalty when trial comes. Right? Okay. It's in such times that you know if you have a true friend or not. Because trial shall prove trust. So that's what shall do. Again, pointing, hinting at what will happen between them in the future. So, this is what Philadelphus says to Euphus. He says that he loves Euphus. Philadelphus says that he loves Euphus. So the authorial voice states that the friendship was too soon acknowledged to be genuine. Too soon acknowledged to be genuine because you needed time to prove true friendship. Now we're something on two months. Okay? So it was too soon acknowledged to be genuine. So need time I can test true friendship. And when I mean time, I mean time.
So they embrace each other many times, which is a sign of love and friendship. And then they settle down for dinner with The dinner is not with food or music, but only affection. These two friends are inseparable. They do everything together. They do everything together, reading, sleeping, and everything. It is stated that Pilatus is city born and city bred. His father is late. Pilatus is city born and city bred, and his father is late, was born and raised in the city. Pilatus has an association with Don Ferrado, one of his late father's friends. So Don Ferrado, uh, Pilatus has a link with Don Ferrado, there in the characterization. Don Ferrado was one of his father's friends, late father's friends. Don Ferrado is the mayor of Brackley. Don Ferrado is the mayor of Brackley. So Don Ferrado has a daughter by name Lucilla. Lucilla is the heir of Don Ferrado because she is an only child. Lucilla is the heir of Don Ferrado. The heir of Don Ferrado is his daughter, the only child. She's the most beautiful lady in Naples. She's the most beautiful lady in Naples. Right? The author says this about Lucilla. The author says this about Lucilla. And I quote, we just basically don't need to write everything. Right? For as the finest ruby stained the color of the rest that be in place, or as the sun dimmed the moon that cannot be discerned, so this gallant girl, more fair than fortunate, and yet more fortunate than faithful, increase the beauty of them all and change their colors. Talking about how she was the most beautiful girl in the city. Now, Pilatus is in love with Lucilla. Pilatus is in love with Lucilla and would have married her if Euphus did not come into the picture. Pilatus is in love with Lucilla and would have married her perhaps if Euphus did not come into the scene. One day, Don Ferrado travels to Venice and leaves the daughter alone in the house. One day, Don Ferrado travels to Venice and leaves the daughter alone in the house. She uses the opportunity to invite Pilatus to the house for dinner. But Pilatus decides to go there with his very good friend. All right, Euphus. So has to go there with his very good friend, Euphus. At the initial stage, Lucilla gives Euphus a cold welcome, as if she didn't like him, as if she doesn't like him. It is Livia, the less beautiful lady, who gives, who gives, you view some attention.
Um, Pilatus is apologetic for coming with Euphus and pleads with Lucilla to welcome him for his sake, calling Euphus his shadow. That's a, that's a, a serious metaphor. For someone to be someone's shadow, that means the, per the person cannot go anywhere without the person, right? Because you cannot go anywhere without your shadow, all right? So, Lucilla is coy or reserved in her response as was expected of ladies at the time. But Euphus takes her by the hand and speaks to her, praising her beauty and how the sheds often shields her from sun and urges her to take him as a shadow, which is above. which was, resembles a shed. Lucilla's response is full of foreboding. You know what foreboding is in literature? Like omen, foreboding, omen. And this is exactly what she says. Pay attention, that you understand the omen that I'm talking about. Well, gentlemen, in arguing of the shadow, we forego the substance. Hinting at how she will leave Pilatus, who is the real guy, to the person that was introduced as shadows. Now she politely asks Euphus to sit down for dinner. Euphus is taken by Lucilla's beauty, and it is her beauty that he has for dinner. Euphus is taken by Lucilla's beauty, and it's her beauty that he has for dinner, not the food that was served. So it is love at first sight for Euphus. It is love at first sight for Euphus. This is seen in the statement. Here, Euphus at the first sight was so kindled with desire that almost he was like to burn to coal. So at the end of the supper or dinner, they go into discussion on love and learning, as was the manner of the time. After dinner, there had to be an intellectual talk. It should be a topic for discussion. And the topic today is love and learning. Philotus is given an opportunity to, to lead the discussion, but he passes it to Euphus. Now that mistake, that's the second mistake. Because Euphus, being an intellectual, a scholar, is going to use the opportunity to do what? Shine to shine. All right? He's going to use the opportunity to shine. To show off. To impress. So that is Pilatus' second mistake. So Euphus obliges. And he masterfully handles the discussion to, to the admiration of Lucilla. One of the issues that they raise in the discussion is the dialectics between appearance and reality. The people of the Renaissance were concerned with appearance and reality. The theme of appearance and reality. What appears and what actually obtains. Another issue that is raised during the dinner is beauty versus character. Beauty versus, versus character. And how difficult it is to see the beauty, a beautiful woman with character, or a woman of character, one has character, who has beauty. Okay? So it's always, probably there's beauty and there's no character. If there's character, there's no beauty. So the man has to choose. 
So all through the, the novel, you can see that human realities could be measured based on dialectical relationships that cannot be mapped. So in talking about, in raising the issue of appearance because of reality, beauty, and culture, you could have it in this statement. Do we not commonly see that in painted pot is hidden the deadliest poison, that in the greenest grass is the greatest serpent? That at once talks about appearance and reality, beauty and character. The grass looks green, but you should be careful because it might meet a serpent there. And the pot is beautified outside, but you don't know that inside there is poison. The painted pot is even the deadliest poison, and the greenest grass is the greatest serpent. And then I want to note this rhetorical question because it also hints at the, at the theme of beauty and character, appearance, and reality. How frantic are those lovers which are carried away with the gay glistening of the fine face? How frantic are those lovers which are carried away with the gay glistening of the fine face. That means that the lover that goes with appearance is likely to make mistakes. Because behind the fine face can be something deadly and dangerous. Another issue that is raised in the course of the dinner talk is the complicated nature of women. How difficult it is to understand women, really. There are choices in men. There are choices in men. How women choose men. Okay? This is seen in the expression, beautiful ladies tend to disdain those who desire them most. Men that probably they do not know how to choose or what to choose, or to make the correct choice. Probably mean that beautiful ladies will end up with the bad guys. Okay? With those who will make them cry. Every day. It's also revealed in the Nina talk that ladies keep secrets a lot. Ladies keep secrets a lot. And that ladies have lots of secrets. Okay? At the end of the day, what we see is that Yuki's speech is full of wit and wisdom. And this enthralls Lucilla. Which is why I said that it was the mistake of Philotus to have let him have the opportunity to speak at the dinner. Okay? His speech is full of wit and wisdom. And that impresses Lucilla so much. And at the end of the day, at the end of the speech, Euphus asked. Lucilla to give a response to what he has said. Means that he's a very tricky person who knows exactly what he's doing. Lucilla responds by saying that women are to be one with every wind. Can you imagine? Women are to be one with every wind. 
this is suggestive of the fact that her heart has already turned away from Pilatus. And she's making it look like the woman is there to be spoken to and then won by any man. So, at the end of our speech, which is very short, um, Euphius makes another speech and then soon ends his speech and then leaves the party with Philotus. So, Philotus is not even given in, um, time to even say anything. And at the end of the day, we are told that Lucilla is deeply in love with Euphius at this point. It's like deeply in love with Euphius. So alone in our room, Lucilla says, Oh, my Euphius, little dost thou know the sudden sor sorrow that I sustain for thy sweet sake. Whose wit had bewitched me, whose rare qualities have deprived me of mine own quality, whose courteous behavior without curiosity, without curiosity whose comely feature without fault, whose filed speech without fraud had wrapped me in this misfortune. Effectively suggesting that she has fallen in love with Euphus. And now she's pressing her hand, his handsomeness, his intelligence, and other aspects of behavior. So you see that you see that at this point, from this point onward, Lucilla is not herself. Euphus also has the same feeling. About her. So, this work reveals or portrays the woman as the fickle sex, as the fickle sex. F I C K L E, as the fickle sex. And raises the theme of inconstancy in love. That the woman's love is not constant, it shifts, it continues to shift. It changes with time and season. So all through this time, Lucilla is trying to justify why she will leave Pilatus for Euphus. trying to rationalize on our choice. At the end, she, she, she decides to base her action on Euphus' speech, which said that women are likely to be inconstant in love. So most of the themes of this novel are the, um, portrayed in page. For instance, we have the theme of love versus lust. The theme of love versus lust.
and we could use that thing to, des to describe the relationship between Euphus and Lucilla. Among other issues that are raised in the novel. So, because of time, we are going to pause this story for today. We'll meet again, we'll continue.